Hello, I'm Michelle Crummel, and in this lesson we are looking at how to interpret the derivative as a rate of change. For our introductory problem, we are given a graph and a description. A car leaves town at time t equals zero and heads east on a straight highway. Its position in miles from the town at time t minutes is shown below. In everyday language, we want to describe the behavior of the car over the time intervals 57 to 68 and 68 to 104. So between minutes 57 and 68, we are talking about this little portion of the graph right here. And we can see that the position is constant. The position is 63.8 the whole time. So the car is not moving. And then on the interval from 68 to 104 minutes, that's this portion of the graph right here, the car is changing its position, so it's heading away from the town because the position is increasing. And we could also talk about the average rate of change, right? This is a linear segment here. The car has moved 43 miles over that 36 minute period. Find the slope of the line between these two points. So for the slope, we would compute 106.8 minus 63.8 over 104 minus 57. And that gives us approximately 0 0.915 if we round to three decimal places. And that is the change in position over the change in time. So miles per minute. Now we saw in the last lesson that we can define the derivative of a function as f prime of x equals the limit as h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So this f prime of x is 1 type of notation we can use to represent a derivative. But there are other notations that we can use to represent the derivative. And here are some examples of ways that we can do that. Lagrange notation is the one we've been using, the f prime of x. Or if we come out of um, the full function notation, we can simply just say f prime. So if you hear f prime, it means the derivative of the function f. We could also use Leibniz notation. And Leibniz notation generally looks like this, dy over dx. Now the variables don't have to be called y and x, but oftentimes when we write equations, they're written in terms of x and y. So dy over dx, and hopefully that's easy to remember because derivative is slope, and slope is change in y over change in x on a certain interval, right? So the symbol that we use in mathematics for change is often this capital delta. It's the Greek letter delta. So delta y over delta x, the delta we can write as a d for delta, and we get dy over dx. So that is another notation that we can use for the derivative. I could say, dy, oh, now it might sound strange, I'm saying dy dx when it's dy over dx, but we typically don't say the over part. You can, there's nothing wrong with that. But usually you just hear people say dy dx, and it's understood that they mean dy over dx. So I could say dy dx equals 5, for example, and that would mean that the derivative of the function y is equal to 5. We also have Euler's notation. Oh, before we go into Euler's, there is a second way to write Leibniz notation that we're seeing right here. So we can uh, instead, let's say, for example, our function was y equals the sine of x. So I could say dy dx equals, and then state what the derivative is. So we'll just leave that question mark for now. Or I could say, write it like this and kind of bring the y out. And now I would read this as, you could still say dy dx, but, or you could say 
derivative of y. So now y is in parentheses. That's the thing that we're taking the derivative of. The derivative is like the mathematical operation that we're performing on whatever's inside the parentheses. So this would just also be the derivative of sine x because y equals sine x in this example. So I could also write this d over dx of sine x. So different ways that we can notate or indicate that we are taking the derivative of something. So this is a nice notation to use if I want to ask you to find the derivative of something. I might say find the derivative of e to the x or find the derivative of x squared plus 3. I could insert whatever function I wanted to find the derivative of inside the parentheses here. So that's a nice notation that we will be using. The Lagrange notation and the Leibniz notation we'll be using frequently and interchangeably. Euler's notation and Newton's notation I'm not going to be using in the course, but if you are looking at other websites or looking in math textbooks, you might encounter these other two notations, so I wanted to include them here for you. Euler's notation, we would use the capital D for the derivative, f is the name of the function, and the little subscript x indicates that we're taking the derivative with respect to x. That's defining x as the independent variable for the function f. f, the de dependent variable, x, the independent variable. We also have Newton's notation here, which is a really nice, easy notation. I don't know why we don't use this more often, but it's the y with the little dot on top of it, and that would indicate derivative as well. So I mentioned this a moment ago, but let's talk in more detail about Leibniz notation. We often do express the derivative using Leibniz notation, and that's the dy dx notation. It's helpful to remind us that derivative is slope, because as I said, the derivative as slope, we can think of as change in y over change in x, or delta y over delta x, or dy over dx. But the reason I really like Leibniz notation is because it's very helpful for interpreting correct units for our derivative. When we describe the units for our derivative, we just want to include whatever the units are for this variable, our y variable, per, and then whatever the units are for this variable, the x variable. So you see I wrote that down here. It's the units of y per units of x. So where that fraction bar is, we would say the word per. Units of y per unit of x. For example, let's suppose that gravel is poured into a conical pile. V of t gives the volume of gravel in cubic feet after t seconds. What are the units of v prime of t? So it's helpful to figure out the units by converting this notation into Leibniz notation. So v prime of t, if we are converting that into Leibniz notation, is dv over dt. We don't have x and y as our variables here. We have t and v. T is the independent variable. That one is going to go on the bottom. V is the dependent variable. That's the function value. is giving us volumes. So that's our dependent variable. dV over dt. And we know the units for V, the volume, are cubic feet. And the units for T, the time, are seconds. So the units on V prime of T would be cubic feet per second cubic feet per second. Next example, C of R gives the total cost of paying off a car loan that has an annual interest rate of R percent. What are the units for C prime of R? So this one can be a little bit confusing just because I think we're used to hearing units expressed a certain way when we talk about financial problems. But let's think about the information that we actually have. Our function is C of R. So the value of that function is the cost. The output variable is the cost. The input variable is R. And let's think about the units that we're told for cost and the units that we're told for R. So it says C of R gives the total cost of paying off a loan that has an annual interest rate of R percent. Oh, it doesn't actually say dollars, but all of the answer choices, the monetary unit is dollars. So let's just assume dollars. 
So C dollars. And then we have to figure out what are the units for R. Well, R is the interest rate, and the units on that interest rate are percent. And our derivative, C prime of R, would be DC over DR. So the units for C, dollars, and the units for R, percent. So dollars per percent, dollars per percent. Next example, G of V gives the fuel efficiency in miles per gallon of a car going a speed of V miles per hour. What are the units of G prime of V? So if we write this in Leibniz notation, it's D G over D V. This time V is the input variable, the independent variable not the output like it was for the volume problem. So this function notation here, this is the independent variable in the parentheses. So that one goes on the bottom, the dv. And then this is our dependent variable. Oftentimes, instead of independent and dependent, I prefer to use input and output. It's a little um, less confusing. But we want our derivative to be dg over dv. So what are the units of g? g gives the fuel efficiency in miles per gallon. So this is miles per gallon over dv. What are the units for v? v is measured in miles per hour. So our units are miles per gallon per miles per hour, and it's actually okay to leave it like that, but that's not one of our answer choices. Miles per gallon per miles per hour. So miles per gallon, miles per gallon per miles per hour. If we simplify this fraction, we have a complex fraction here, so if we uh, take the reciprocal of the denominator and multiply instead, the miles are going to cancel out and leave us with hours per gallon. So that might sound a bit weird, but mathematically is correct, hours per gallon. Let's talk about how we might estimate the value of the derivative. Suppose B of T represents the number of new blossoms on a plant T days since it began blooming. So right away, we've got information about units. B, the output, is measured in number of new blossoms. And then the input variable, T, is measured in days. So we'll keep that in mind. Estimate B prime of 7, and using correct units, explain what this value represents. B prime of 7. So we can see from our table that b of 7 equals 24, but that alone doesn't tell us much about b prime of 7. b prime of 7, remember, is the instantaneous rate of change in the number of new blossoms per day. And we can use the average rate of change to estimate the instantaneous rate of change, and we know that our estimate will be better if we work on a small interval surrounding the point where we really want to know the derivative. So we're going to use something called a central difference. And to do that, we're going to find the average rate of change using the closest two surrounding points. So we really want to have information about b prime of 7. We're going to take the two closest surrounding points and calculate the average rate of change. And we're going to use that as an estimate. So the average rate of change is going to give us the slope of a secant line on an interval containing the point that we're interested in. And the slope of that secant line is going to be used to estimate the slope of the line tangent to our function when t equals 7. So to estimate the slope, we're going to take the second y value, 15, minus the first y value, 33, and divide that by the second x value minus the first x value. And that gives us negative 9. So that is going to be an approximate value for b prime of 7. That's approximately b prime of 7. I don't want to say equals b prime of 7, 
because we're just using the average rate of change here to estimate the instantaneous rate of change. Now we want to explain what this value represents and we want to make sure that we're using correct units in our explanation. So there's several important things we have to include in our explanation. We want to make sure that we are thinking about b prime of 7 as an instantaneous rate of change and that means it's the rate of change at the instant when t equals 7. So somehow we have to indicate that. We also need our units. So for b prime of t, that's db over dt, it would be the number of new blossoms per day is negative 9, and then we want to interpret that in a sentence. So we could say something like on day 7, or 7 days since the plant began blooming, something like that. I'll, I'll go ahead and say it that way. 7 days since the plant began blooming. Seven days after, might sound better, after the plant began blooming. Then I need my B of T, so the number of new blossoms is, and then I'm either going to say changing, increasing, or decreasing. And I'm not going to say increasing because we saw that our average rate of change was negative. So we don't want to say increasing here. We can say decreasing. And if we say decreasing, that implies the negative. So I can say decreasing by 9, or I could just say changing by negative 9 if, you want, if you're not sure which way to go. I'm going to go ahead and say decreasing because it just sounds like better English is decreasing by, and I'm going to say about because this is an approximation, by about nine new blossoms per day. And I can make this better if I say, instead of just decreasing by, decreasing at a rate of about nine new blossoms per day. I think that sounds better. So we have our instant seven days after the plant began blooming. That makes this instantaneous rate of change or derivative. It has to be at a specific point on our function, in this case, at a specific time. And then we have um, in context our variable b and then we have the value of our derivative, so that is the negative 9. So for the negative 9, we're saying decreasing at a rate of about negative, or of about 9, because decreasing implies the negative. And then new blossoms per day are the units there. So it's important to include all of that in your explanation. For our next example, a potato is placed in an oven and its temperature F, measured in degrees Fahrenheit, at various times T, measured in minutes, is recorded. Use a central difference to estimate the instantaneous rate of change of the temperature of the potato at T equals 30. So if we're going to estimate the instantaneous rate of change, we're going to do that using a central difference again. So we'll take the closest two surrounding points to T equals 30 which would be this 15, 180.5 and 45, 296. Those are the closest two surrounding points. And we're going to find the average rate of change and use that to estimate the instantaneous rate of change. So it would be 296 minus 180.5 over 45 minus 15, which is 3.85. Now the units there. So we've got the change in F, right? When we do slope, it's the change in F, and that's degrees Fahrenheit, over the change in time here, and that is measured in minutes. So our slope, which is our derivative, 
or even our average rate of change, whether we're talking average rate of change or instantaneous rate of change, the units there are going to be degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Okay, then part B, use a central difference to estimate the instantaneous rate of change of the temperature of the potato when T equals 60, and include units with your answer there. So we would do something similar, take the closest two surrounding points right there, and compute that average rate of change. So the 342.8 minus 296 over 75 minus 45, 1.56 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Now, without doing any calculation, which do you expect to be greater, F prime of 75 or F prime of 90? Well, if we think about the situation, it should match the values, what we're seeing in the table. The potato is put into the oven, so immediately it's going to start to get hotter and it's increasing in temperature very quickly in the beginning, but then it, that starts to slow down. It's still increasing in temperature, but more slowly as it approaches the temperature of the oven, right? So the potato, we wouldn't expect the potato to get hotter than whatever temperature the oven is set to. And we can see that once we get, you know, 60 to 75 minutes, 75 to 90 minutes, yes, the temperature is still increasing, but much more slowly. So this should be a larger value. F prime of 75, I would expect to be higher than F prime of 90 because the temperature is increasing, but it's increasing at a decreasing rate. And the rate is the derivative. So that means it's that the derivative is decreasing. If I say it's increasing at a decreasing rate, then the derivative is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now suppose F of 64 equals 330.28 and F prime of 64 equals 1.341. What are the units on these two quantities? F of 64 is not the derivative, it's just the regular function. The temperature of the potato at time T equals 64 minutes. Okay, so the 330.28 is just the temperature at time 64 minutes. So the uh, units there would just be degrees Fahrenheit, 330.28 degrees Fahrenheit. But F prime of 64 is the rate of change of the temperature. That's DF over DT. DF over DT. And so that's going to be degrees Fahrenheit per minute. So the 1.341 would be degrees Fahrenheit per minute. What do you expect the temperature of the, of the potato to be? when t equals 65. So we don't have a value 65 in our table. We can use these surrounding points to estimate the derivative, but that's not really what the question is asking. It's asking what do you expect the temperature of the potato to be. So it's asking us to estimate f of 65, not f prime of 65, like we were doing in the previous examples, but just f of 65. Well, we know what's going on at time 64. So we can use what's happening at time 64 to help us estimate what's going to be happening at time t equals 65. And we're going to do that by writing the equation of a tangent line. We will find the equation of the line tangent to f at t equals 64 and use that to estimate the value of our function f at t equals 65. So our tangent line equation is going to be y minus f of 64, that's the y coordinate, equals the slope, which is the f prime of 64, times x minus that x coordinate. That is the line tangent to the graph of f at the point where t equals 64, f of t, I should say. And we, we know these values, we can sub in. So y minus 330.28 equals, now f prime of 4 is the 1.341 times x minus 64. So the y is approximating f of t. 
So I'm going to write the y as f of t, but it is just an approximation. I'm going to add 330.28 to both sides of my equation. So instead of an equal sign, I'm going to put an approximation symbol. 330.28 plus 1.341 times x. Oh, I keep mixing up my x's and t's. In this problem, the independent variable is a t, so let me fix that. That should be a t, and that should be a t. Okay, so now if I want to estimate f of 65, it's approximately 330.28 plus 1.341 times 65 minus 64. And that is going to give me 331.621, and this is just f of 65, so the units are degrees Fahrenheit. That's not a rate of change, that's just the temperature, the actual temperature, well, our estimation for the actual temperature. And that does seem to make sense with what we're seeing in the table. Let's say at 65, we have an approximate value of 331.6 degrees. Write a couple sentences to describe the behavior of the temperature of the potato on the time interval from zero to 90, so over this entire time period as well as the behavior of the instantaneous rate of change of the temperature of the potato on the same interval. So we talked a little bit about this, and we could say something like, the temperature of the potato is increasing at a decreasing rate. Therefore, the instantaneous rate of change is positive, but decreasing. For this next example, a function that relates gasoline consumption to speed for a particular model of car is given by C equals F of S. C is the gasoline consumption in liters per kilometer, and S is the car's speed in kilometers per hour. Data provided by a car company tells us that F of 80 equals 0.015, F of 90 equals 0.02, and F of 100 equals 0.027. Use this information to estimate. Whenever I'm reading a problem and I see the word estimate or approximate, I always circle it. In this case, I'm going to highlight it. but. If I'm working on a piece of paper, I will circle it because it's easy to forget that we are working with just an estimate or an approximation, and we want to be careful with our notation. When we are finding an estimate, we don't want to say equals, we want to use the approximation symbol. So it's asking us to use this information to estimate the instantaneous rate of change of fuel consumption with respect to speed at s equals 90 indicate units on your answer. So let's convert some of these words into symbols. The instantaneous rate of change, we know that's the derivative. What is it the derivative of? Fuel consumption with respect to speed. The with respect to part is what goes on the bottom. That's our independent variable. It's defining that input variable for us. So it's fuel consumption with respect to speed. So it's the derivative of fuel consumption over the derivative of speed. And let's see if those things were already defined using symbols up top. The fuel consumption is given by a function C. So we can say DC. C is the gasoline consumption in liters per kilometer. S is the car's speed. So for the speed, we'll use an S. So that means we are trying to estimate dc ds, or we could say c prime of s. Now this is also defined, c is defined to be f of s, so we can also use the notation f prime of s for dc over ds. So I'm going to write that one down as well, f prime of s. If you prefer to write it that way, that's okay too. So if we had a table of values, and I'm trying to estimate dc ds at s equals 90, and um, we have some notation for that as well. So if we're using the f prime notation, that's easy. We can write f prime of 90, and that indicates that we're trying to figure out the derivative of the function f when the input value is 90. In the Leibniz notation, we can write it like this, dc over ds, when, so I'll use a vertical bar, it's a tall vertical bar for when, or you can also say at, when s equals 90, so down at the bottom, almost like a subscript, 
we write s equals 90. That's how, we, how I would show that I'm looking for the derivative at that specific value of s. And we are just approximating it, so we're probably not going to be able to get it exactly. So I should change um, this second symbol here to an approximation. Okay, so if we had a table of values and I wanted to approximate f prime of 90, I would look for the two closest two surrounding points, which would be f of 80 and f of 100. Those are surrounding points. So then we could say it's going to be f of 100 minus f of 80 over 100 minus 80. That's the average rate of change, and we'll use the average rate of change from two nearby surrounding points to estimate the instantaneous rate of change. So we're already given those values. Now I can use an equal sign here because now the equal sign just means that I'm going to, about to tell you what this thing equals. So that would be 0 0.027 minus 0 0.015 over 20. And on my calculator, I'm getting scientific notation, 6 times 10 to the negative 4. So that is approximately 0 0.0006, 6 times 10 to the negative 4. And then our units here, so let's be careful about units, the dc over ds. We want units for this variable c, which is liters per kilometer, and then for this variable s, kilometers per hour. Okay, so we can write that all out. It's kind of long. Liters per kilometer per kilometers per hour. By writing a complete sentence, interpret the meaning in the context of this problem of f of 80 equals 0 0.015. So f of 80 is also just referring to c when s equals 80 and s is the speed. So the 80 means that the speed is 80. And the f is the really like the C, so that's going to be our gasoline consumption. C is the gasoline consumption. Now this is not a derivative, f of 80, that's not a derivative, it's just the value of the function. So it's going to tell us the gasoline consumption at the moment when the speed is 80. So if I'm saying this in a sentence, it might be like this. When the car is traveling 80 kilometers per hour, its fuel consumption is 0.015 liters per kilometer. Now write a sentence to interpret F prime of 90. So F prime of 90, this 90 is the speed, that's our input variable, or in, the value of our input variable. And then the F prime now, the F prime is the derivative. So it's not the fuel consumption or gasoline consumption. It's the rate of change, the instantaneous rate of change of that gasoline consumption. So now our sentence is going to be like this. When the car is traveling at 90 kilometers per hour, that's the instantaneous part, its fuel consumption is increasing. And we say increasing because it's a positive number at a rate of, and here was the rate that we found, 0 0.0006, and then the units for that rate, for that derivative, liters per kilometer per kilometers per hour. So when the car is traveling at 90 kilometers per hour, its fuel consumption is increasing at a rate of 0 0.0006 liters per kilometer per hour. And the reason we used the word increasing here is because we found that the derivative was positive. If the derivative is positive, we say increasing. If the derivative was negative, we would have said decreasing, like we did on the um, problem with the flower blossoms. Okay, our last example. A slow freight train chugs along a straight track. The distance it has traveled after x hours is given by the function f of x. An engineer is walking along the top of the boxcars at a rate of 3 miles per hour in the same direction as the train is moving. The speed of the man relative to the ground is what? So we have several different options here. 
the function f of x is just telling us the distance, not the speed, just the distance. So if we want the rate of change of the distance with respect to time, that would be our speed, that would be our derivative. So it has something to do with f prime of x. So f prime of x is going to give us the rate of change, the velocity that the train is moving, the velocity of the train itself. But then we also have the person walking in addition to the um, movement of the train. So we want to go with the combined total f prime of x plus 3. So this is the instantaneous rate of change of the train combined with the instantaneous rate of change of the person. Okay, so that does it for this lesson. In the next lesson, we are going to be talking about something called the second derivative. So it's related to the derivative, but it's a little bit different. It's called the second derivative. See you next time.